from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. After logging thousands of miles, crisscrossing the Midwest, and after collecting 1,400 samples from corn and soybean fields in seven states, Pro Farmer releases its final projections. We'll have analysis from tour leads. There were some real issues with kernel depth in the Western Corn Belt, uh, Western Iowa in particular. Plus, analyzing the agronomics of the 2017 crop. And we're in an area of Minnesota that saw record crops the past two years. So what's the outlook for 2017? We're in the field later on Ag Day. In Crop Tour, continuing to pull international attention. Ag Day. Presented by the Chevy Silverado. High strength steel for high strength dependability. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Descriptors of Midwest crops this year are not very flattering. Scouts on the Farm Journal Crop Tour tossing out words and phrases like immature and variable to describe the corn crop in the east and shockingly low and disappointing pod counts in the soybean crop to the west. To that end, our partners at Pro Farmer have released their exclusive national estimate of the corn and soybean crops. Pro Farmers estimating this year's corn crop at 13.95 billion bushels on an average yield of 167 bushels an acre. You can compare that to USDA's August forecast of 14.2 billion bushels, an average yield two bushels higher than Pro Farmer. Now, Pro Farmer's soybean estimate comes in at 4.33 billion bushels and an average yield of 48.5 bushels to the acre. That production estimate slightly smaller than USDA's estimate earlier this month. Now, Pro Farmer's estimate based on assumptions for, quote, normal weather through September. The analyst using data collected during crop tour for part of their national estimate, but they also factor in data from other states outside the tour and historical differences. State by state, it's clear that the eastern corn belt took a punch from Mother Nature. Heading west, the statewide yield averages improved. But as Pro Farmer describes the Illinois crop, impressive yields were scarce. And South Dakota clearly has drought issues. Now in soybeans, Ohio was the only state of the seven on tour where pod counts went up from last year, but they need warmth and water to finish. Western parts of the Midwest disappointed crop scouts with their pod counts, and Pro Farmer's yield estimates reflect that in each state. Minnesota leading all states on the tour in projected corn yield, although soybeans sit toward the bottom of the list. Tyne Morgan takes us to the land of 10,000 lakes for a look at this year's crop. Well, Clinton, we definitely saw it all during the 2017 Farm Journal Midwest Crop Tour. A great deal of variability in the fields. And while that variability did turn into more consistency as we made our way into Minnesota, it still wasn't a perfect growing season. Strolling through southern Minnesota's cornfields. We're looking at mainly 16 around for rows and on this cob you're obviously not filled out all the way to the end. Crops look promising. I think we're looking at 200 plus for an average hopefully but that I mean, we still got a long ways to go so that could change but I'd say it's going to be an average year probably not above average. While it's not an encore performance to the record some farmers saw in 2015 and 2016, Peterson says corn did have a strong start. It's hard to tell at this point just because I'd say we're a little bit behind 2015 when it comes to maturity and how far along the crop is. But for soybeans, there de there's definitely plenty of pods. The spring wasn't as favorable. A lot of it last year was just the spring was a little better, so I got off to a better start. I mean, the beans didn't look impressive until end of June, early July. They just seemed really, really short and like they weren't really growing. While yields are good, Peterson still thinks he's not standing in record bean. For Eastern Lake agronomist Mark Bernard. Overall, I'd say we're in pretty darn good shape. He likes what he sees, but agrees a record crop may not be in the cards for area farmers. My initial re reaction is it's probably not going to be on a par quite with last year. 2016 was kind of our high water mark for most folks. Uh, 2015 was nothing uh, to sneeze at. So either way, I mean, if we had to say, well, let's get a 2015 crop, we'll say, yeah, we'll take it. And with not a lot of high heat, Bernard says weather during key pollination time was just what the crop ordered. You couldn't ask for much better um, conditions in terms of temperature. If you look at a lot of these years, they're filled right to the tips right now, and especially in those areas where we've got adequate moisture, it, it really looks good. Mild-mannered summer weather that could brew trouble this fall. I'm always worried about an early frost. Uh, it's 
it's something with this cooler weather that we've had that is always in the back of your mind. Uh, if you wake up some morning in mid-September and all of a sudden you look at the thermometer and it's down to 30 degrees, it's panic time. And it's that threat of an early frost or even a normal frost that has a lot of farmers on edge here. But Bernard says the good news is they didn't see a lot of disease pressure this year. A little bit of rust in corn, a little bit of white mold in soybeans, but for the most part, they really didn't have a lot of issues in 2017. Reporting from Northfield, Minnesota, I'm Tyne Morgan for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Tyne. A big reason crop tour data is comparable to previous years is because of consistency. Scouts always travel the same routes, but pick fields at random. Well, in South Dakota, scouts only take samples in the southeast corner of the state. But this year, the western and central portions of that state are facing tough drought. Betsy Jivin looks at what the tour didn't see. A tough year does not even begin to describe what this growing season has been like for western South Dakota producers. I can't remember a year like this. A dry winter and a hot and rainless summer shut plants down. Some of those that are just blistering, I don't think they're going to make it. Two thirds of the state is in a moderate drought. Nearly half is in severe. Nothing's going to be in, that, in all those spots. And Presho producer Dennis Stanley is in the middle of it. You've got ears that are like this. And they just started up when they started getting rain. The area received some rain earlier in the month, but it did not come in time. But it does, it does give us hope. Dennis says he will harvest this field. If our corn could do 70, we'd probably all be thrilled at this point. If I had cattle, I would be cutting all of it for silage, I'd say. Many did, bailing thousands of acres of wheat. Sorghum may be next. Does that have any chance of making it? there's no way this is going to make seed. I mean, there doesn't look like there's a lot of feed value here. It's so short, but it's still, people are so desperate for hay this year and for feed that I'm sure he would bail it. 25 miles east, the farmers say the corn is still behind in maturity, but they're pleased with how it looks. Yep, it's phenomenal with, uh, with the shortage of rain, how that's filled out almost completely to the end. Yep, that'll make corn. Reliant South Dakota producer Thad Schindler says August rains helped, and luckily those showers found him. A couple inches where 10 miles down the road, they didn't get nothing. In fact, it completely changed his plans to chop the crop for silage. What we thought we were going to cut for silage is uh, going to make good corn now. Both producers say this drought is worse than 2012. Even though it was a drought year, it was a good year for us. And the 2012s and the 13s and the good years we had, we're going to have to dip into some of that right now. A worse year for conditions, but the economics are not the same. Our crop insurance prices were set close to $6. We're not going to be $4 this year. We're not going to have anywhere close to our guarantees. And while the stressful growing season may be nearly over. Where I farm, it's, uh, it's about over, but if we go another month without rain, it probably is back again. 2017 has made its mark, a memory they hope to not relive anytime soon. Reporting in Reliance in Presho, South Dakota, I'm Betsy Jibben. All right, when we come back, Tyne Morgan joins us from the end of the trail to discuss findings from this year's Farm Journal Midwest Crop Tour and what it may mean for markets in the weeks ahead. And later, the influence of the crop tour reaches beyond our U.S. borders. Deciding whether to sell your old equipment? Well, Machinery Pete's Pick of the Week lets you stay informed on current market prices, allowing you to set the best possible price for your equipment. Text Pete6 to 31313 to get started. Welcome back to this special edition of Ag Day as scouts gather in Rochester on the last day. Tyne Morgan caught up with leaders Chip Flory and Brian Grady for their reaction to the 2017 crop. All right, here now with Chip Flory and Brian Grady, fresh off of Crop Tour. Chip, you were on the west, Brian, you were on the east, but let's flip this around. What okay. was the biggest surprise that you saw come out of oh. Brian's tour? Okay, uh, Monday night, right out the gate, that Ohio crop, it, it uh, came in a little bit better than what I expected it to. Brian will explain that it's because of the immaturity of that crop over there, maybe measuring a little bit of extra grain like and then Illinois, that Illinois yield coming in down, what was it, 6.6% .6 from a year ago? Yeah. 
uh, with the way that Brian's team has been zeroing in on Illinois over the last couple of years, coming in at 180 bushels, that's a little concerning. What was the biggest surprise that you saw out of the West? Oh, clearly the uh, pod counts out of Western Iowa, yeah. one, four, and seven crop districts that were yeah. down significantly. I mean, th those are, you know, attention grabbing. So, you know, we talk about these pod counts, and last year I know, you know, there were a lot of uh, uh, um, blooms still going on, a lot of potential really for the, those pods to fill out. Do you feel like that's the case this year, that we could see this soybean crop still grow in yield? Well, uh, they can still plump up if they have enough rainfall here late in the season. Uh, we didn't see a lot of flowering out there, so they aren't going to add pods. I think the biggest thing from my side was we counted in some of these areas, you know, everything that's a quarter inch or bigger, and we counted a fair number of quarter inch, half yeah. inch pods. Uh, so for those to develop, they're going to need late season moisture. They're going to need some time. Yeah, and uh, we, we, we are going to assume that, that uh, we have assumed that that bean crop is going to get what it needs to finish and finish with an average size okay. bean. That's what we are assuming. And what about with the corn crop? Was it mature enough that you feel like you actually got an accurate feel for how big this corn crop is this year, Chip? There were some real issues with kernel depth in the western corn belt, uh, western Iowa in particular. Uh, so, yeah, we measured that the yields down a bit from year ago in western Iowa. But when I start to think about the size of the kernels compared to what they were a year ago, makes me want to lean down just a touch more. Okay, closing thoughts real quick. What do you want to wrap up with? Uh, you know, it's a good crop. It's not a great crop. Yeah. And, and in some of the areas, it's a really poor crop. And so we're going to have a big divergence in terms of where the bushels are this year, I think. Yeah, Chip. Yeah. Uh, 14, 15, 16, we measured yield. Yeah. This year, we measured a lot of yield potential. All right. Please stay with us. We'll be back with more Ag Day in just a moment. Welcome back to this special edition of Ag Day. Now with meteorologist Mike Hoffman. Mike, we're trying to figure out if this crop can finish, and you've got a little bit longer look at the forecast this week. Yeah, we're going through the 90-day, uh, and I am concerned. If we stay in the pattern we're in right now, then we could be in trouble in places because okay. it's colder east of the Rockies. But uh, I do think that pattern will evolve. I'll show you that coming up. Drought monitor right now continues to be extremely dry in the far northern plains, eastern Montana. And some moderate to severe drought also extends southeastward into parts of uh, Iowa, even Illinois, as you can see right there. But most of the lower 48 really not seeing issues with drought at this point. Now, taking a look at uh, uh, the situation a month ago, you can see we were a little bit worse in the far northern plains, especially the Dakotas, where it has improved slightly over the past four weeks. Not a lot. You've had some rain, but it takes a while to get rid of a, uh, an extreme to exceptional drought like we have been in in that area. All right, here's the weather pattern I was talking about where we've had the trough in the east, ridge in the west. We started to go away from it for a week or two, and now we're back to it. And uh, as you'll see on Wednesday, still kind of troughiness in the east, ridge in the west. Watch what happens. The next piece of energy just dives right on into the middle of the country for uh, next weekend. Now, obviously, it's, it's too early to be talking about a frost or freeze uh, quite yet, but if we stay in this pattern, that will happen at some point, and that could be some uh, really bad news, uh, like Clinton was saying. Here's the temperatures this week, then. I'm going below normal. Now, part of this is because of all the moisture we're going to see, all the rain we're going to see uh, from the remnants of the hurricane, and that will continue to uh, move northeast. So we're going below normal from the northeast into the uh, Gulf Coast region, near normal in the far southeast, normal northwestern Great Lakes down into New Mexico, and then above normal west of there. Taking a look at uh, precipitation this week, then we'll go below normal for most of the west. You'll get your typical amounts in the Four Corner region. But then, uh, obviously, the remnants of Harvey continue to uh, cause some issues as it moves toward the northeast. Exactly where that's headed is uh, still a little bit up in the air, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it, it has already dropped a lot in the uh, Gulf Coast, western Gulf Coast region. September temperatures. Here we'll start the 90-day above normal in the far northeast. Below normal from Missouri, Kansas, southward. Above normal Dakotas and most of the west. I'm going near normal for the, uh, the Corn Belt, but... It only takes one snap of cold weather 
to give you some real issues there, and that's what we're concerned about. October temperatures still below normal. Southern plains above normal northeast and mid-Atlantic and above normal out west. And kind of the same idea overall for November above normal east coast. Below normal middle of the country, above normal in the far west. Here's precipitation over the next 90 days. Obviously, they're going to be above normal after, after Harvey in the uh, southern portions of the uh, country. But above normal from the east coast down to Texas, near normal for most of the center of the country. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. First of all, for Fresno, California, hot and humid. Lots of sunshine, high of 105. Bemidji, Minnesota, partly to mostly sunny and nice, high of 78. And Evansville, Indiana, variably cloudy, a shower or thunderstorm likely, high around 82. Up next, agronomists from the tour discuss the health and disease pressure in the Corn Belt this season. And later, the international appeal of Crop Tour as it captures global interest. Driving thousands of miles through the Corn Belt gives scouts a pretty good idea. The condition of the crop and this year's look yielded interesting perspectives as always. Ty Morgan once again with the tour agronomist in Rochester. Here now with Emily Carlin as well as Mark Bernard, Eastern, Eastern Lake agronomist, Western Lake agronomist, also with DuPont Pioneer. But we want to get some insight now. We kind of know what the, the numbers are on crop tour, but what you saw in the field. Any trouble spots um, agronomically that you saw on the western side of the tour, Emily? Absolutely. So let's start with today, Tyne. We went through Minnesota, and the one thing that we did notice is that the only place where I really saw any disease pressure was there in that soybean field. The, the white mold was really starting to become apparent. The, the worst one that I saw was in that was in Waseca County. And, and the white mold was definitely a presence there. I think it's just the moisture that we had, and, and that's what we saw. Yeah, and, and Mark, you reside here in, in Minnesota, right. and we talked a little bit about white mold uh, showing up a few weeks ago with right, you. Right. Uh, but now I, I definitely saw some driving through these fields, enough that you think that it will do some damage uh, to some of, these, some of these soybean yields. No question about it. Right in that neck of the woods in particular, uh, before I left, we could see it was really starting to come on. And I heard from Chip when I got in, he says, hey, you got, you got to look south of New Richland here and see what's going on. I says, I'm afraid I know what's going on. Yeah. I've been out here before when we've had SDS up the yin yang and, and uh, you know, a few other things going on. But this was about as smooth as any year I've ever seen that in, in that respect. Emily, you know, what we've seen on this tour is the maturity of the crop. It just seems so far behind. In your mind, how far are we behind uh, in, in some of this crop out there? It is. It's far behind. The thing that I noticed is if you, if you did walk into a field that seemed a little bit more mature, it's probably because of the drought stress area that we went through in Iowa. That spot right there, it, it, it's apparent down there. But the thing is, it's some of the yields that we got, it was still showing big yields because we count length and we count kernel rows around. But you break open that cob tine, and it, and honestly, the depth is not there mm -hmm. with that further along maturity mature corn. So, which state on your tour? Which state, if if a, a, a nor early frost hit or even a normal frost would hit, which state would suffer the most in your mind? You know, probably Iowa at this point. Uh, Minnesota isn't far behind because we've had a lot of cool weather here. It put the brakes on us here. We were up 5% on our GDUs not all that long ago. We're running about even right now, last I knew. So that means we need to land in September on a lot of this corn to make it into the bin. Yeah, so a lot of flat pods. Emily, Mark, thanks so much for being with us today. All right, up next, reaching beyond America's farms to grain buyers across the globe. In the Country, sponsored by Kubota. Discover the power behind the M6 series at Kubota.com or visit your local Kubota dealer today. This year on the 25th anniversary of the Crop Tour, we saw a record number of scouts, nearly 150 participating in the week. And as usual, many of those scouts were from other countries. Pro Farmer says 26 international scouts were on the tour this year, representing 11 foreign countries. Now, a number of them were in the U.S. for the very first time. And for most, investigating the size and scope of the American crop is part of their job. I mean, this crop tour does get, you know, watched and people take interest all over the world. Uh, the U.S. is, is, you know, one of the, the biggest producers and exporters and, and uh, yeah, it's very critical to global markets. I mean, we need some better information. It's for us an experience to see how you do this here in the U.S. 
And I mean, all Brazilian farmers and all the players in Brazil, they all need uh, information and they want to see what's happening here. Welcome to America. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in, spent part of your day with us. For Time, Betsy and Mike, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day in farm country. Ag Day is powered by Ram Trucks, America's longest lasting pickups.